mankind and the elements. For some, it's an uncomfortable bond. It's getting worse out here, guys. For others, when weather strikes, inspiration begins. You come to a place like this, the stars just burst. These are the people who challenge nature, seek out its limits, reveal its secrets, and embrace its awesome power. In this episode, we'll meet a group of civilians putting their lives at risk to rescue people trapped in Iceland's extreme environments. When you get called out, your heart goes pounding almost out of your chest. A man who climbs hundreds of feet in the air in the hopes of protecting some of the oldest trees on Earth. And a team of sailors racing up the treacherous coastline of the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, we're, uh, we're really scared. These pioneers of the great outdoors ahead on That's Amazing. The moment right before I jump, there's a split second there where everything goes completely silent. And that's when I push off the edge. Three, two, one, see ya. We have all wanted to fly, but who would willingly throw themselves off a mountain? My name is Ellen Brennan, and I'm a wingsuit base jumper. Currently, I'm the fastest flying woman in the world when it comes to wingsuit base jumping. A wingsuit is a special suit that inflates with air and allows you to, in essence, fly or glide. Ellen does this all over the world at crazy speeds. On average, I'm flying about 180, 190 kilometers per hour. That's almost 120 miles an hour. So when I'm going to go do a jump, I'm focusing on what's happening weather-wise. I'm looking at the trees to see if there's wind blowing. I'm watching the sun to see if it's heating up the air. I don't want to push my luck with the mountain. My vision is the first thing I notice, but everything becomes very focused on just my feet. My heart's beating super fast. It's usually beating like 160, 170 beats per minute. Sometimes people will talk to me and I won't even hear them. And as soon as I push off, I can hear the slip of my feet off of the rock. Like it's something that shouldn't happen. It's not natural, <laughs> but I'm doing it. How in the world did I get to be able to do that? It's one of the coolest things in the world. Like I can't think of anything better to do. <laughs> it's pretty mind blowing. In the dangerous seas of the Pacific Northwest, 44 sailboats are competing in one of the longest and most grueling human powered races on earth. The race to Alaska is a 750 mile journey and the only way forward is by wind or by oar. Here, the water and weather conditions are extremely unpredictable. If you get stuck in them, you're on your own. It's getting worse out here, guys. We have to go to Bella Bella. I don't think there's any other sport that relies so heavily on the weather to propel you, but you also have to respect it, otherwise it will destroy you. Spencer Weber is with Team Hot Mess, a crew of four young Canadians with little endurance sailing experience. They're racing against faster boats with more seasoned crews in a sail contest that knocks out more than half the teams that attempt it. So for these intrepid young sailors, it's not about winning. It's about making it to the finish line in one piece. Race to Alaska is a 750 mile, engineless, unsupported boat race from Port Townsend, Washington to Ketchikan, Alaska. And there's only two checkpoints in between. You have to go through Seymour Narrows and you have to go through Bella Bella. But other than that, it's choose your own adventure. The race is really unconventional because sailing has so many rules. So we wanted to strip it all away and make it about just any boat, no handicaps or anything. And if you can make it first, you get $10,000. There's a lot of different battles going on in the R2AK. Fellow racers who you're trying to compete with, but you're also trying to overcome these enormous forces of nature, wind and current, and you're just in this tiny little boat trying to take on these challenges head on. 
Team Hot Mess are well aware of the dangers inherent with sailing in the Pacific Northwest. They train for the race in nearby Vancouver, British Columbia. So we had four crew. It was myself, Neil Roberts, Will Schwanger, and Nick Schwanger. We met here and decided to do the race together. I was a civil engineer uh, in the middle of a quarter-life crisis, and it was between staying in my cozy cubicle or going on a suffer fest to Alaska, so I decided to go to Alaska. Anyone who tells you they're doing it for the 10 grand is lying because the guys who are gonna win it are doing it in hydrofoiling, carbon fiber, fancy boats, and to them, 10 grand is just chump change. For me, I just love sailing, and the R2AK seemed like the steepest learning curve around. Five, four, three, two, one! The race start was at noon, and everyone's sprinting down the docks to their boat, jumping on the boat, untying it, and then everyone's using their human propulsion method to get out of the harbor. So everyone's rowing and pedaling and paddling as quickly as they can to get out. The adrenaline's going and everyone's super stoked and the atmosphere is just wild. Sails are up around the corner. We're finally racing the last, boys. Rounded the point out of Victoria Harbor there. It was awesome wind. All right, first transition zone. Oh yeah, we're sailing now. When you get further north, you have a great deal of current. That wind against tide condition can cause standing waves. It will be very difficult for these vessels to try and get through that area of the coast. As soon as we rounded Chatham Point and entered Johnstone Strait, the gales picked up. You know, we had like 35 knots on the nose and we're like bashing through all these standing waves. And we have a pretty light boat, so we were getting some like hang time off waves. It was making all kinds of crazy sounds. And then once you get through the Johnstone Strait, you're going up the outside of BC, then you're in open ocean and that presents its own challenges. Massive swells and no shelter from wind and you feel so alone. It's, it's really humbling especially when a storm starts ripping through. Good. The forecast was for 35 to 40 knots, and we were seeing like maybe five to like seven knots. We didn't listen to the weather forecast and just got slammed by 35 knots of wind. Yeah, we're, uh, we're really scared right now. So we turned around and now uh, we're, we're trying to find somebody's dock or something, but nobody lives here. So there's not a lot of docks. It was driving rain, big waves, and you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. It was so dark. There were no lights on land. We had no idea where anything was. We couldn't anchor because we brought in sufficient anchor gear. So we just had to like keep sailing around in, in circles until daylight basically. Getting caught that night before, it was a bit of an eye-opener. From there on, we kind of like took the forecasts a lot more seriously. We mapped out a bunch of bailout points, so if we'd have to stop, we knew on the map like where we could go. Coming in to catch where Dan. Going? Oh my God. Looking forward to being dry. Hell yeah. You know, we've been in our dry suits for 24 hours straight, and everyone's wet and cold and tired, and then the wind just completely shut off. You're paddling into the finish line of this epic race that you've just done. It was super anticlimactic, but the race isn't about the money and it's not about the finish line, it's about the journey. There couldn't be a more poetic end to the race to Alaska than a brutal hate mission to the finish line. <laughs> I would definitely do the race again. You kind of need this like blind optimism to get through it and the ability to forget pain and suffering. On the sandy shores of the Florida Keys, sea turtles are laying their eggs, but a threat is looming for these gentle creatures. The Caribbean climate has become increasingly unpredictable as rising sea levels cripple the beaches 
where these turtles annually nest. They come back to their natal beaches. So animals that were born here are coming back to this very little spit of land in order to lay their own eggs. If the beach goes away, they may not be as flexible to use another beach. Dr. Kristen Hart and her team of researchers are working around the clock, tagging and tracking these turtles in an effort to protect their future. They're imperiled, they do need help, and we're trying to figure out you know, where the problems are. We are here on East Key in Dry Tortugas National Park. We are about 70 miles west of Key West and we're in the Gulf of Mexico. There's seven islands. We are on one of the smallest, but one of the densest turtle nesting beaches. Some of them are right on top of each other, a foot away from each other. This is a almost completely marine park, and the turtles come up and grace us with their presence. It's pretty amazing to see these animals up close and, and personal with them, and we get, you know, right in there. And generally, sea turtles date back to the time of the dinosaurs, so it's 200 million years of evolution. Our study was the first to really concentrate on the dry tortugas turtles. Our goals are to try to determine patterns of movement and habitat use to figure out where they might go. points are either sightings or capture points. When we first started working here, we realized that we could dip net juvenile green turtles. I had done this in the Everglades, and out here, the water is much more clear. We can pursue them in the flats and, and shallower areas. She's coming up. The bigger turtles out here, we do what's called rodeo capture, or also turtle jumping. They're usually 10 or 15 feet down, but when they need to come get a breath, they're coming up to the surface, and so that's when the diver meets them down there. You basically get your hand sort of on the rear and right behind the head, and you get the animal pointed up. We got him. It's a team effort. Once we get them on board the boat, we'll do a standard workup, which includes measuring them, weighing them, taking blood samples, tissue samples. There's a lot of questions that we can ask, even just about how healthy they are, and how healthy then are the resources that they're using. We also fix devices on them to track their movement, so we've used acoustic telemetry, radio telemetry, and then satellite tracking. So we're learning a lot about their movement paths and their, their areas of residence. They've been around the globe, but they're hardwired to come back to the very place where they were born to lay their own eggs. If an animal was born on East Key, She'll come back to East Key. She's not going to go use Loggerhead Key or one of the other keys here. We all take turns every 30 minutes walking around this beach in particular. It takes about 10 minutes to walk around. If they nest, we let them nest and mark off where the nest is, and then we work her up just like the same workup we would do with a little turtle. She's corralled in a box because they can be 400 pounds and they're very powerful. They'll do that about every two weeks during a season. And when we get recaptures, that's really exciting because you know the animal still survived wherever she went. In order for turtles to lay their eggs, the conditions have to be just right. Ideally, they'll encounter high tides, dark beaches, and warm sea surface temperatures. Otherwise, they'll do something called a false crawl in which a turtle will make their way onto the beach only to turn back around. We don't know really why they false crawl, but something isn't right. Maybe they're not feeling contractions. Maybe the conditions just aren't right at that spot. Maybe they dig and they hit a piece of a coral or a root or something like that. And false crawls could become more frequent. Rising sea levels reduce the amount of available beach space, and rising temperatures can drastically affect sand temperature. Studies show that cooler nest temperatures produce more males, while warmer nests generally produce females. With sea level rise and climate change, they're threatened. I think we're a little more concerned about their trajectory of their population, because it's generally not good for the turtle.
we've learned a lot about these dry tortugas turtles, and it really is valuable to me to, to know that they value the research that we're contributing. We're answering questions that are important that haven't been asked before. It's definitely demanding, but at the same time, I think it's one of the most rewarding things we could ever do. There aren't many people allowed on this little patch of land, so I feel very privileged to be able to, to play a role in you know, figuring these turtles out and being in this very special place. Italy's Mount Etna is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It erupts nearly every year, spewing lava and clouds of ash. But for Claudio Lanzafame, the black powder is an untapped adventure. My name is Claudio and I ski over volcanoes. I have been skiing since I was four years old. I spent most part of the year close to the mountain. When I spend time away from it, I feel nostalgic, like if something is missing to my soul, to my life. And in this moment, I take my ski and I go up. Mount Etna is located on the east coast of Sicily. It is known as the tallest and active volcano in Europe. The risks to climbing Mount Etna are the same of any other mountain. Uh, you have to be careful and uh, respect what's surrounding us. The view from the top is unique. You can see the landscape changing many times, from green woods to desert volcanic area, all the lava flow and the coast. Black powder is volcanic sand and it's formed during the eruption. It's incredible. Ron Hilmarsen is an Icelandic baker with an unconventional oven. He bakes bread by burying it underground, where it's heated for 24 hours by nearby hot springs. It's very common to see hot springs here in Iceland. There is constant lava crawling under us. This lava is heating up water, and this water comes boiling up on the surface. We could put it in the oven, but this is much more fun. Iceland is one of the most volcanic regions in the world, with 30 active volcanoes at any one time. That helps create an abundance of hot springs, some with boiling hot water, and Siggy uses them to his advantage. He specializes in baking huvabrod, a traditional Icelandic rye bread recipe that dates back hundreds of years. I know for sure that in this village, uh, I can track it down as far as late 1800 something. My grandmother taught my mother how to bake this bread, and my mother taught me. In uh, the hot spring rye bread recipe, we have rye, flour, sugar, baking powder, salt, and milk. We put this in a pot, we put butter in the pot, then we uh, wrap it with plastic foil, and we put it down in our hot spring hole for 24 hours. It's very obvious to see if the ground is hot or not. I never use a thermometer. If I need to check the heat, I just use this one. Our biggest challenge is rain. If it rains a lot, these holes that we are using can cool down. And if they are not hot enough, obviously the bread doesn't bake completely. Everybody eats our bread. Our visitors, the locals, hot spring rye bread has a unique taste that you don't get from ovens. The texture of this bread is quite special. It's quite heavy. It's not the typical light bread. 
when you show this to travelers that come to Iceland and you see their faces, they go, wow. Then you start to think that this is quite amazing, actually. There's lots of amazing weather phenomenon happening all over our planet. But what's going on outside of our atmosphere? My name is Leland Melvin, and as an astronaut, I can tell you weather conditions in space can be a matter of life and death, especially during a spacewalk. When we prepare for a spacewalk, we have to be able to deal with temperatures that range from positive 250 degrees Fahrenheit in the sun and minus 250 degrees in the shade. But in our spacesuit, we have the ability to withstand those temperature extremes because we have visors that reflect the sun away from our eyes and we have heated gloves as well as a heated suit. And then we have cooling that allows us to stay cool during those temperature extremes. A solar flare is a sudden flash of brightness observed near the sun's surface that emits X-ray and UV radiation. In space, the radiation levels can be deadly. When we're notified of a solar flare on the space station, we retreat to what we call the doghouse. This doghouse is lined with water bags that allow us to block the radiation coming from the sun before it gets to our bodies. And that's where we go to keep from getting exposed to high energy radiation. As we go further out into our solar system, weather events become more and more extreme. Jupiter, our solar system's biggest planet, also features its most impressive storm, the Great Red Spot. The gigantic tempest is twice as wide as planet Earth and has winds that reach up to 400 miles per hour. It's been swirling over Jupiter for at least 150 years. Further out, Neptune features its own great big storm. It takes up the planet's entire atmosphere. Neptune is our solar system's windiest planet with wind speeds that can reach up to 1,500 miles per hour. That's nine times faster than the strongest winds ever recorded on Earth. To find the strongest known winds in our universe, we have to go well beyond our solar system. Astrophysicists at York University have discovered the fastest winds ever recorded near a supermassive black hole. These wind speeds clock in at 125 million miles per hour. I hope my crew never gets caught up in anything like that. Known as the land of fire and ice, Iceland is an island of extremes, where people wage a relentless war against the elements. It's seriously unpredictable weather. It's basically like a battle zone of different high pressure, low pressure areas. Anything can happen. Dangerous conditions mean people can find themselves in serious trouble and in need of rescue. But there's a problem. The small country has no army or government program to help. So citizens form the Icelandic Search and Rescue Team, known as ISAR, a national emergency force. They're everyday people willing to risk their lives to save others in the worst conditions imaginable. You're going out in the conditions when everyone else is supposed to be inside. So you have to be a little bit crazy, but in a good way. ISAR is a community of volunteers that responds to calls for help all year round in Iceland. I think to take part in ISAR you just have to be willing to put forward the skills that you have. I sometimes consider a rescue team like a village. Um, you need every kind of person to make everything work. I think it's kind of amazing because it's all volunteers. We have professors, taxi drivers, carpenters, plumbers, office workers, just name it, men and women, all kinds of people. It's very hard to imagine Iceland without our association and our teams.
Iceland's breathtaking landscape attracts tourists and adventure seekers from all over the world. But that beauty can lure people to a false sense of security. The weather conditions can change faster than anything else. You can have a sunny day, and in two minutes, it's a storm. Wind, rain, even snow in the summertime. People are just going for a hike and they're pretty confident that the mountain that they're going on is not dangerous. We have the lower glaciers which have become quite a popular tourist attraction and people are going for walks on these and they are full of crevasses, extremely dangerous, super slippery and then they fall over and hurt themselves. Then they have to rely on search and rescue to come and find them. For average citizens to gain the skills needed to be part of ISAR, they go through a rigorous 18-month training program. They learn mountaineering, climbing, and orienteering. It takes a huge skill set, but when you can't deal with any weather, then you can go out and help people. Across the whole country, I think our teams get 4.5 call-outs per day. Our people, they're running from their own work or their family to join the team. When I get called out, we have three codes. It's F1, high priority, life in stake. F2, not as high priority. And F3, easy going. When you get called out, high priority, and you get your text that it says a child, and your heart goes pounding almost out of your chest and you run out. I don't even say goodbye to my children or wife. I can remember one call, a boy got lost in Selfos. All I could think about was my son. If he got lost, I would like to have everyone helping. So a lot of emotions comes up when you get called out. I'm proud of the unity and the fact that people are willing to sacrifice their spare time uh, to help others. The feeling that I get when we rescue someone, it doesn't have to be me that finds the person. It can be another group searching somewhere else, but we're searching for the same person. When someone gets found, you get this wellness feeling. We did something right. They are our heroes in, in so many ways, but in Icelandic culture, we don't do a lot of hero talk. No, I'm not a hero. I'm just a part of a team. I'm not a hero, no. I'm just a normal person. I'm very proud of the association and what they have accomplished. They've saved a lot of lives. California's iconic sequoias are the largest trees on Earth. These giants have lived for thousands of years, surviving war, famine, and the rise of globalization. But California's ongoing drought could mean disaster. These enormous trees are already showing signs of weakness never seen before. Anthony Ambrose and a team of researchers are heading into the forest to climb hundreds of feet in the air and see what can be done to save these magnificent trees. Sequoia National Park is just absolutely amazing. A giant sequoia is the largest tree on the planet. And they have these huge orange trunks and massive sprawling crowns that have huge limbs. Some of the branches are five, six feet thick. They live to be more than 3,000 years old. I'm fascinated with how they grow and how they are able to get to be so old and so big. It's just an amazing experience to be able to study them so intimately and so closely. California is currently in the middle of a severe drought. The giant sequoia trees appear to be showing some symptoms of some drought stress. 
more stress than we've ever measured in giant sequoia trees, and we want to know why. Our research entails climbing the giant sequoia trees and measuring their water status, basically an, an index of how stressed they are relative to the environment. The water status of all plants is kind of like the equivalent of blood pressure in a human. It's just a basic measure of how much water they have available to them to continue to function and grow. So we clip little shoots of foliage and put them in this device that is able to measure how much tension the water column is at at the time that you cut that little piece of foliage. We put the little piece of foliage leaf end down into this pressurized chamber and the amount of pressure it takes to push the water back out of the stem is equal to the amount of tension it was under when you cut that piece of foliage. When water availability declines, such as during a drought, that creates a lot more tension in the tree. When the tension becomes too great, then tiny little air bubbles form in the wood, and when it gets bad enough, then the plant suffers and starts to die. There's a couple reasons why we need to climb to the tops of these trees. As water moves up the tree, it's fighting gravity and friction, and the top of the tree is gonna be the most stressed part of the tree. So in order to get a really good idea of how stressed they are, we need to go to the very tippy top. It's a really humbling experience because you're up in the crown of these massive ancient things and they make you feel small. I'm at the top of a very large giant sequoia tree. We're waiting for the sunrise because it's really, really pretty this morning. In order to get a really good understanding of how the trees are responding to the drought, we need to understand different time periods. We climb up into the giant sequoia trees at the pre-dawn hours before the sun rises and measure their water status kind of at their most relaxed state when they're not losing water to the atmosphere. And then we also go back in the middle of the day when they're the most active and most stressed and measure their water status and collect leaf samples at that point as well. Giant sequoias really need fire. It's a natural part of the ecosystem here. They can use this information to prioritize where they do prescribed burning to be able to thin out some of the understory trees that are competing for the water and hopefully provide more water to the large giant sequoia trees. It's important to realize and, and remember that these trees have been living for thousands of years and they've dealt with pretty severe events, fires and droughts in the past, and they're amazingly resilient. One of the things that really is remarkable about these trees is their ability to recover from drought type events. The question is, as conditions change, as temperatures continue to increase globally, are conditions gonna change to a point where they may reach some threshold where they're not able to recover from these type of events? It's an absolutely amazing, unique experience to be able to climb into these trees. We wanna preserve them. We want them to be here and we want them to be healthy and happy. It's a surprisingly dangerous mission. Safely navigate the skies of one of the most iconic tourist destinations in America. The helicopter pilots of Niagara Falls battle extreme wind and unpredictable weather conditions, all to give tourists that one spectacular view. Sometimes it is very scary. You try not to let the fear overcome you. So you control the aircraft, you get it back to a safe environment so you can go home at night. That's the name of the game, go home. <laughs> My name is
name's Stanley Snapkowski. I've been flying over Niagara Falls about 20 years, and each day is different. I spent 20 years in the military. I've flown in Germany, England, Vietnam, and the weather here is nothing like anything else. Niagara Falls is beautiful, but like anything beautiful, there's a ugly side to it. The weather here can change quite rapidly. You can have snow showers, and five minutes later, you can have bright, sunny, blue skies. You have to have the health and respect for it because it can go wrong in a matter of minutes. The winds can gust up to 30 to 40 miles an hour. When the wind comes around the buildings, it tends to create mechanical turbulence, either an updraft or downdraft or swirling. And then sometimes when you make the turn into the wind, it's almost sometimes like hitting a brick wall. I've had instances where the aircraft wanted to come apart, quit flying, and we nursed it down to the ground, we got down and we walked away. And it could have ended up differently without the training, without the knowledge. <laughs> As the only pilot on board the aircraft, if something happens, it's my responsibility to get everybody down safely. I don't like being scared in the helicopter. I'm not a thrill seeker. I don't take a lot of unnecessary chances. I have a skill, I have knowledge, I know my aircraft, and I know my capabilities, and I try not to exceed those. I sometimes think that Mother Nature is not my friend today because of the winds or because of the rain or snow. You deal with that. You hopefully come out on the good end. Or the other thing is, is you just sit there and say, okay, you win today. I'm not going to fly. <laughs> I look at the falls and I see the beauty of nature. Some days is after a major storm comes through, the air is so clear, you have maybe 100 miles visibility. And it's just awe-inspiring to be able to see all that and uh, see the falls from a different angle. I just love it. There's a lot to love about living in a big, bright city. People, culture, late night food. But there's something missing. It's there, but you can't see it. The night sky. This is the story about a small town in Colorado. Actually, two small towns in Colorado. That are devoted to space. Westcliff has a population of 564 residents, and Silvercliff has a population of 575. This used to be a mining community, and then it evolved into a railroad community, and then into a ranching community. We are always looking to do something that will bring people into our community, and lately that seems to be we need to invest in our sky. So they made light pollution their enemy. They darkened their towns so that the night sky could become their star attraction. Have you ever seen the Milky Way that goes from horizon to horizon? 88% of the world's population has never seen the Milky Way. It's the most magnificent thing in the world. That's what we see here. But for the towns to go dark, they needed to cover all of their lights. Not just street lamps, but the lights outside every house and ranch near town. That wasn't easy. This is a frontier town, and I can tell you, frontier people don't like being told what to do. We had to win their hearts and minds. It took 10 years. They passed ordinances, raised money to cover the streetlights, and even built an observatory. The darker the town became, the more people saw the light. In 2016, the valley's dark sky was designated as one of the darkest in the world drawing visitors from all over. Okay. Might need a six pack though. Not as big as this, that's Well, I was really hoping we'd be able to see Saturn by now. Yeah, me too. That a community would decide to 
dim its lights and help everyone to appreciate the beauty of the night sky is an amazing thing. You come to a place like this and the stars just burst and it's remarkable. Not a lot of people are lucky enough to see the dark sky as our ancestors saw it, and I feel that we're a very special place to be able to look at the stars as people did thousands of years ago. It's a humbling thing. Suddenly you realize you can almost touch it, and you're now a part of the bigger universe. And so it's just a wonderful experience to see the dark skies, and that's what we're trying to preserve. <laughs>